Amen. Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 31, it reads like this from the English Standard Version. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? God, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Is, it is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. <laughs> I see how today's going to go. <laughs> Let me read that again so that some believers in the room will see what it's saying. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. There we go. And who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us right now. And who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So tribulation or distress, persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors, through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. The word of the Lord is blessed. You may be seated. Grass withers, the flower fades. God's word remains forever. I would like to title our sermon from this passage as we conclude this series in Romans chapter 8. I would like to title this sermon, The Best Thing to Ever Happen. The Best Thing to Ever Happen. Last week, a friend of our family was in town from Dallas, and she shared with us a remarkable story. She's a clinical psychiatrist, but she also leads a mental health program at a nonprofit health clinic that serves at-risk youth in Dallas, Texas. She showed us how, in the mental health program that she is leading, how she gave the children there an exercise. And the exercise was to imagine a story where their enemies are their negative emotions. But to then draw a picture of themselves as the superheroes of a story of them overcoming their negative emotions. So to imagine a story that their enemies are negative emotions, but they are the superhero in the story that, are, that is overcoming, winning the battle against their negative emotions. Y'all with me? The children in her program are children who are, like I said, at risk. They're at risk of being incarcerated at risk of dropping out of school, at risk of addiction, and many other things. Most of the children are coming from homes that are broken homes and are having problems in their homes. And so her program is designed to help them to avoid some of these pitfalls and to give them access and tools and opportunities and resources that they would not have otherwise. And so this is an activity exercise that she does to try to engage them. So she explained how one of the guys in the program who was just 12 years old who even at that young age is experiencing a lot of massive trauma in his life. And she said, when she looked at his picture, she said to him, explain to me what's going on in your picture, because in your picture, it looks like you're surrounded by your enemies, and it looks like your, your enemies are about to defeat you. What should I make of this? I mean, I told you to be the superhero in the story that overcomes your enemies. I can see that you have a cape on in your picture, and that you're the superhero, but your enemies are surrounding you like they are about to win. She said he responded, and Pastor Tony, you're going to love this one. She said he responded, well, Doc, I prefer when a superhero story has a sequel. He went on to say, so you can't understand my story just by looking at page one of my story. He said, Doc, if you'll turn over to the next page, 
the next page is where my sidekick kicks in and I get some special powers on the next page. On the next page is where I get the victory in over to overcome my enemies. And I came to church this Easter Sunday morning just to let someone know and to encourage someone else to remember that we celebrate on this Easter Sunday morning. We celebrate that although Jesus died on Friday and things looked helpless and hopeless and dark and bleak, it looked like the enemy won. That was not the end of the story. That was just page one of the story. Because although Friday ended with Jesus being buried in a tomb, it was just a borrowed tomb. Because the report remains true that he died until death died on Friday. And he stayed in the grave all night, Friday night. And he stayed in the grave all day, Saturday. And he stayed in the grave all night, Saturday night. But the report is that early Sunday morning, when you flip the page to Sunday morning, that's when special power kicks in. And he got up out of the grave. The empty tomb is still proof that our Savior lives. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living whatever y'all may not say right now. <laughs> Because I see his hand of mercy and I hear his voice of cheer in just the time I needed him. He is always, always near. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and he talks with me along life's narrow way. I may not be preaching to you, but I'll preach and encourage myself right now. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You may ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Thank you, Jesus, for getting up out of that grave. I know some of you may think that I've gotten ahead of myself, that I've started where I probably should have ended. <laughs> because it seems I've used what should have been my closing for my introduction. But I always feel like on Easter Sunday morning, you should just get right to the point. <laughs> we all know why we're here. <laughs> We're here because Jesus got up, so we might as well talk about the fact that he got up and celebrate the fact that he got up. And then the other thing is that a lot of folks come to ch um, church on Easter Sunday, and I'm glad that you're here. No shade. But um, it, th this might be the last time I get your attention for another year or two, and um, you might fall asleep before I get to the end of the sermon. So I want you to know right up front what's going on <laughs> in case I lose you. We gather today because we have hope. And our hope lies in the fact that Christ got up out of the grave. He died for my sin and for your sins on Friday. But he rose on Sunday morning to give me life and to give you life by placing our faith in him. But here's the other thing. The picture that that 12-year-old boy drew also helps us to sense what Paul is trying to lay out as he brings this chapter to a close in Romans chapter 8. Paul has been writing on a tear. It's like he, his pen is, is not even lifting from the page. Because as he's writing, it's like he's getting excited as he writes, and he just keeps thinking of one thing and another thing and another and another and another and another. And it's almost like he is about to burst in praise. It's like one long run-on sentence because he is so excited about all of the implications of Christ's death and resurrection for us. And so when we pick up on verse number 31, when he says here, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? I hope that you can get a feeling of what Paul is getting at here in this verse. Because as we've been saying over these past few weeks, Paul does not gloss over the fact that even those of us who place faith in Jesus will experience suffering here on earth. That we will experience difficulties. That we will experience trials and tribulations and temptations. And I probably 
would be able to get a few in the room who will testify that that has been true for them even though they place faith in Jesus. So what Paul is trying to do and what he is saying here is that even though at times it may seem like we're surrounded by our enemies. It may seem like and look like and feel like there is suffering all around us, that there is difficulty all around us, that there are trials all around us, that there are tribulations all around us, that there are temptations all around us. It may feel that way. But what he is saying is that we need to know that what we feel right now is just one page of our story. And that when it feels like we're about to go under and perish, that that means the story has not ended. It means that you have not gotten to the final page of your story. God has not finished writing your story. Because if God is for us, who can be against us? If God, who got Jesus up out of the grave and has all power, if he is for us, who, what, nothing can be against us. And this is the hope that we have, that God has not finished writing our story. And even though it may look bad right now, and even though you may be having a bad season or a bad day, as my friend says, you don't want to call it a bad day until all the days are in, until all the pages have been turned. Because what Paul is passionately lifting up for us to see is that even though stuff can try to be against us, it doesn't matter what tries to come against us because God is for us. None of that stuff stands a chance of being victorious over us. Because God is for us, since he is for us, if he is for us, none of that stuff has a chance of being victorious over us. That's why we sing this song in the church. Who can stand against our Lord? No one can. No one will. Who can stand against our king? No one can and no one will. Now, I know that many of you are probably about to tune me out. But before you tune me out, I want you to see in this text how Paul, in a way, underscores this claim. He, um, better word to use is he is underwriting his claim. He is verifying why he can say this and why we can trust this with such certainty. I want you to listen to what Paul says in the next verse, verse number 32. He says, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Paul is saying that if God did not spare his son Jesus, Surely, he's not going to withhold any resources that he has at his disposal to make sure that we're good. His son, Jesus, was the greatest resource and most valuable, expensive thing that he had at his disposal. And so if he gave that for us, if he did not spare that for us, that means that there's nothing else that he won't use at your disposal. There's nothing else that he will not do in order to help you out. If he gave you all that he had in Jesus, there's nothing else that he's going to withhold from you. This language that God did not spare his son but gave him up for us all is actually significant language. It's significant language because Bible scholars all across the world agree that it's clear Paul is using language that references when God tested Abraham to see if Abraham would sacrifice his son Isaac. Some of y'all have been in church a little bit. You remember Sunday school? You remember the story of Abraham? God promised Abraham a son Isaac. 
They finally have a son, Isaac, at their old age when his wife was old and was not in um, 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 age-producing years, and she had been barren all her life. And so they give, um, they get this son, Isaac, but then God tests Abraham and says, Abraham, I want you to sacrifice Isaac. So he and Isaac go up this mountain, and at the top of the mountain, Abraham is literally about to take his son's life. And while his hand is in the air, about to come down to sacrifice his son Isaac, God stops him in a loud voice. And he says, Abraham, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know you fear God, seeing, here's the language, you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. It's the same language that Paul uses here in Romans chapter 8, verse 32. It is the language of him not withholding his son, not sparing his son. So here it is, is God provided for Abraham a ram in the bush to sacrifice instead of his son. When God knew that Abraham was willing to go with, he said, stop right there. I'm going to give you, I'm going to provide another way. I'm not going to let you kill your son. I just needed to see if you would be willing to go through with it. But here is what God says. He says, I'm not going to sacrifice a ram anymore. I'm not going to sacrifice a lamb anymore. I'm not going to spare my son. I am going to sacrifice my only son. It is language to get us to lean in. Because we, even if we don't have children, we know how badly people love their children. And we know that we would never allow anyone to put a finger or a hand on our children. But this is telling us that God, his one and only son, he gave him up to be sacrificed for us. I know you've heard it many times, but don't let that land softly on you. It should land with a thump. That God gave his only son. He did not spare Jesus in order to save you and I. What Paul is doing is he's actually pointing us to the cross in this moment. Because Paul knows that the significance of what happens on the cross. It was on the cross that Jesus shed his blood and sacrificed his life to save ours. And we need to forever keep the cross in view when we face trouble, when we face trials, when we face tribulations and difficulties, keep the cross in view. Because when we see the cross, it should remind us of what God did for us and all that God did for us. And that he, if he did that for us, He's not going to allow anything else to come at us if he allowed that to happen to his son for us. That's why we always need to keep our eyes on the cross. When we are scared and when we lose our way, we need to get back to the cross. It's like the little boy. I, I don't know if I told this story before, but Jackson, my son, he'll let me know if I told this story before. But it's a little boy. He was lost one day. He roamed out of the house and um, lost his way. And so he was crying. He was frantic. He was panicking. Um, he was scared and afraid. And um, somebody was driving by, and they saw him crying, and they could tell something was going on. So they stopped, and they asked the little boy, little boy, what's wrong? And through the tears, the little boy told him, I'm lost, and I don't know how to get home, and I'm scared, and I'm so afraid. And so the person asked the little boy, well, is there anything near your house that you remember? And after thinking for a little moment, the little boy said, the only thing that I can remember is that there is a building near my house that has a cross on it. And the man knew exactly which cross the boy was talking about. So the man took the boy to the church that had a cross steeple at the top of it. And when the boy found the cross, he was able to calm down and relax because he knew he could find his way home if he saw the cross. And I just want to let you know, if you find the cross, all your fears, all your worries, all your concerns, they should just go crumbling away because if he did that for you and I on the cross, Paul is saying that there is nothing that can come against us that we cannot have the confidence that God will keep away from us. This also means, though, that anything that is surrounding you, I heard um, 
Pastor John Faison say this another week, and I, I could not wait to figure out a way to use it. And I, when I found out that I could use it today, I was so excited. He said, anything that is surrounding you that has come at you, it has come at you with a permission slip. Because God never falls asleep and lets things slip by. If any trouble, any trial, any tribulation, any difficulty, any temptation, anything has come your way, know that it has a permission slip. And many permission slips, they're only good for a certain while. Even death, when it came at Jesus, it had an expiration date of three days. It had a permission to come, but it did not have a permission to stay. It had to go. And matter of fact, when Jesus got up, he tore up the permission slip. Death no longer has its sting. The grave no longer has the victory. <laughs> because even death had to get permission. If God loved his son that much and gave his son up to die for you, know that he's not going to allow anything to get at you that will take you out. We see this in Job's account, don't we? That when Satan came to God and asked God to, if he could get at Job, God gave um, Satan a permission slip, right? But guess what? Even that permission slip... Satan could only go so far. It lets us know that even if stuff comes at us, it cannot take us out because God is not going to give permission for that to happen. And so I know things might be difficult now. But if something has gotten a permission slip to get to you, know that it's also because that God thinks that much of you. He knows that you're not going to crumble underneath it. He knows that he is going to give you grace that is sufficient even in the midst of your weakness. He will do that for you too. <sighs> Thank you for the one amen. But that's also why even if stuff has gotten to you, some of you can verify that stuff has gotten to you, but it has not gotten you. Amen. Stuff that gets to you, and the stuff that gets to you, it got somebody else, but it didn't get you because God, even if he allows it to get to you, he'll allow it to make sure that it doesn't get you because there is no weapon formed against you that shall prosper. The stuff may form. And the stuff might even get close to you, but it can't get you. It may surround you, but it can't overtake you because God is only going to allow it to go but so far. But I also need to let you know, there is so much stuff that God does not allow to get to us that we don't see. That's why we say growing up in the church, he kept us from dangers seen and unseen. Y'all cannot imagine all the stuff that God is holding back from getting to you. And he's powerful enough to keep it from getting to you. But he is holding stuff back from getting to you. I know what you're going through is rough right now. But if he had let what is trying to get to you get to you, it would be even crazier right now. And so he is holding stuff back for you. But in this next verse, verse number 33, help me, Lord. Paul does put a caveat in here in this next question that he raises in, chapter, in verse number 33. He said, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Paul is saying that not even the people who try to charge you with your sin, and try to accuse you for your sin, and try to make you feel bad for your sin, try to shame you for your sin, they can't even get to you to do that because of God. But it's also telling that he says, who can bring any charge against God's elect? That word their elect is also can be translated chosen. And here is the caveat is that it is God's elect, God's chosen, who have responded to the call of God to be saved by faith through Jesus Christ that this applies to. That means not everyone Amen. 
can testify that if God be for us, who can be against us? Not everybody can say God is keeping stuff from me and God will protect me through dangers. But those who have placed faith in Jesus Christ, we can say with confidence that he is going to take care of us. It is those who have been chosen, those who have been redeemed by the blood of the lamb, that God did not spare his son to save you, that we can say with confidence, nothing can stand against us. Have you placed faith in Jesus? This might be a good time right now to hear God calling you to repent of your sins, to turn towards him, and to believe in Jesus as the one who saved your soul and who rose on the third day for, to give you new life. This is a good day. Because what Jesus did back there on the cross, it is similar to this guy called Golden Arm James Harrison. Look it up when you get some time. This guy, James Harrison, it's all on Google. Don't look it up right now, later on. <laughs> When he was 13 years old, he needed 13 liters of blood for a surgery that he had to have at 13 years old. And because of those 13 liters of blood that he received, he pledged that when he got old enough, he was going to, when he turned 18, he was going to donate as much blood as he could. It's said that over his lifetime, he gave one, over 1,000 donations of his blood. It was discovered that his blood contained a rare antigen that cured rhesus disease. And the reason why he gave so much blood is because he was able to save so many lives because of a rare antigen in his blood. Over 2.4 million babies were saved from that condition because of something unique about his blood. And many of us stand here to say it was nothing but the blood of Jesus. That washes me whiter than snow. Anybody grateful for the blood? <laughs> Anybody know that the blood still works? If you're able to say you've been redeemed, it's because of the blood. If you're able to say nothing, no weapon formed against me will prosper, it's because of the blood. If you're able to say nothing can stand against me, it's because of the blood. But Paul raises another question in verse number 34. In order to underscore his point even more. Y'all still with me? Yes. See, he's emphatic that another reason we can be so sure that nothing can be against us is because right now, the one who died, Jesus, he's been raised to life. Hallelujah. Thank you for that one. Hallelujah. Easter Sunday morning. We're still going to praise Jesus for being raised to life. It says that he has died. He has been raised to life. But now he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he is interceding for us. Listen to verse number 34. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Here's what it is. It's, that it's, it's not just the idea. It is the idea that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father praying for us right now, interceding in prayer for us right now. But it's also the idea that he is advocating for us right now, that in his intercession he is also advocating for us because there are people who will try to condemn us for the things that we do wrong but Jesus is standing at the right hand of the father sitting at the right hand of the father and he's saying yeah they messed up yeah they were guilty yeah they were wrong yeah they sinned but guess what my blood covers their wrong my righteousness covers what they did wrong I knew no sin, but I took on their sin so that they could become righteous. And so he is now almost as if you can imagine a courtroom. He is advocating. He is our lawyer. He is telling the judge, God, they are not guilty because of what I did for them. And right now, even right now, he's in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father, and he is praying for you. I'm glad my mama prayed for me. I'm glad my daddy prayed for me. I'm glad my pastor prayed for me. I'm glad the church mothers prayed for me. But I'm sure enough glad that Jesus prayed for me, that he had me on his mind, and that he made the time to pray for me. I'm so glad he prayed. Anybody else glad he prayed? When you get some time, look at 1 John 2 and 1, where it tells us, that we have an advocate from the Father, Jesus Christ. 
Hebrews 7.25 says that Jesus is able to save to the uttermost and those who draw near to God through him since he always lives. We can draw near because he always lives to make intercession for us. We see Jesus interceding and advocating in a special way in John chapter 8. In John chapter 8, Jesus was approached by some church folks. And they brought with him this woman who had been caught in adultery. She was caught in adultery, but they brought the woman. I don't know where the guy was, but they brought this woman to Jesus to try to test Jesus. And they asked Jesus, what should we do with her? And Jesus got down on the ground, on his knees, and he wrote with his finger on the ground. And as he started to write on the ground, they continued to ask him, and he stood up and said, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And then he bent down once more and wrote on the ground. And and when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone, standing with the woman. Jesus stood up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. In that moment, when Jesus was writing on the ground, he was advocating for her. He was interceding for her. He was the one saying, yes, they might accuse you, but I do not condemn you. And right now he is advocating for us by continually praying for us at God's right hand. Every time somebody tries to accuse us, even when the devil, our adversary, tries to accuse us. But let me try to come to a close. In verses 31 through 34, Paul has laid out for us how because of God's love that has been demonstrated by God giving his son, that we can be sure that God is for us, that we can be sure that nothing can be against us. That's what he lays out in these first few verses, that because of God's love, we can be sure that God is for us and that nothing can be against us. But then in verses 35 through 39, he underscores it in an even more um, um, significant way, if you will. He's basically saying that because of God's love, Nothing can stand against us, but also because of God's love, nothing can possibly separate us. Not only God's love does it keep stuff from getting to us, but God's love keeps us from getting too far away from him. See, God, his love makes sure that stuff doesn't get to us but his love makes sure that we don't get too far from him. That nothing comes between us that separates us from his love. That's how powerful his love is. Nothing can come against us, but nothing can come between us either. In verse number 37, well, let me start at verse number 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. What he's doing there, that verse is actually, he's quoting from Psalm 44, 22. And it's talking about how those who even in the Old Testament placed faith in God, they suffered and they went through hard times too. And so even them, they know what it's like to to deal with tribulation and distress or persecution. And we know what it's like too. But he says, no, none of those things. In all those things, though, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. You need to know that when he says that we are more than conquerors, He makes up a word. Don't you wish you could make up a word? (laughs) He makes up a word. The word that he makes up, it actually basically means to hyper-conquer something. Not just to conquer it a little bit, 
but that you hyper conquer what it is. And it's not because of what you do, but it's because of the love of the one who gave you this relationship in the first place. Because of the one who loves us, we will also be the ones who don't get too far gone when we're going through our difficulties. Because of his love, when we're going through struggles and when we're going through difficulties, and those difficulties have a way of pulling us away from God, his love is so powerful that you can't outrun his love. You can't get too far away. You cannot be separated from his love. That's how powerful his love is. This pastor is telling us that difficulties can't get to us, but difficulties can't pull us too far away either. And it is all on the basis of his love that we can have certainty of his love. We can have certainty of his love both presently and in the future. This is what he says. I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come in the future, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. I know. Do you know why? Because when he talks about those things, those are the things that are in creation. And guess what? Who created those things? God did. So if God created those things, he's not going to allow those things to separate you from his love. This means that when trouble comes, it can feel like we're being derailed. It can feel like we're being tossed to and fro. It can feel like we are about to perish. But the one who made us and created us new will be the one who saves us again. Even when we try to go astray, even when we face difficulties and we don't know what we're going to do and we are feeling like we're about to perish, his love is so powerful that it will catch us and bring us back. Can I prove it to you through scripture? Ask Ruth and Naomi. Ruth and Naomi were left with nothing. They felt like they were about to perish. But even when they felt like they were about to perish, the Lord allowed them to find a kinsman redeemer. And that kinsman redeemer would actually lead to Jesus being saved, who is our kinsman redeemer. Ask the three Hebrew boys, who when they were tempted to bow down to the gods of the land, they said, no, we're not going to do that. And they said, if we perish, we will perish. And they went into that fiery furnace, didn't they? And the next morning, when they went back to that fiery furnace, they looked in, and there weren't just three. It was now four because Jesus showed up in the midst of their fiery furnace to let them know, I'm not going to let even this fire even singe your garments. They came out of that fire and didn't even smell like smoke. Why? Because the God who created them said, I'm going to save and preserve your life. But here's the one that I really like. Jonah. Jonah went in the opposite direction of where God told him to go. And the boy, the um, the sailors on that boat, all of them knew they were about to perish and were trying to figure out what's going on. And then they finally found out it was Jonah. And so they said, Jonah, we're going to have to throw you overboard, dude, because we're not going down like this. Jonah is thrown overboard because of his disobedience, and he deserved to die because when God said go this way, he went that way. But when he was thrown overboard, what did God do? God used a big old fish to swallow him up and to preserve his life. Because even when we go our own way, God's love for us is so great that he'll come and get us even when we deserve to die. There's a story of this guy named Elgin Staples. Look it up on your own when you get some time. I'm not making it up, but not right now. Don't Google it right now. Elgin Staples was from Akron, Ohio. He served in World War II. 
and he was served on board of this cruiser called the USS Astoria. And one night, the USS Astoria came under attack by a Japanese cruiser. And the attack was so bad that um, over 200 men lost their lives that were on board of that ship. But Elton Staples, he was thrown overboard in the air and landed up in the water, kind of like John. He was dazed and he was wounded, but he was kept afloat thanks to an inflatable rubber life belt that he had put on shortly before the explosion. And so he put this life belt on because he thought something might be going on. And so when he was thrown overboard, this life belt, inflatable life belt, kicked into gear and it saved him. He floated all night long that night out in the sea. And finally, another cruise ship came by, um, another uh, uh, um, USS ship came by. And on that ship, he finally got on that ship. And when he was on board, he began to examine that life belt that he had on that saved him. He was surprised to find out that that lifeboat had been manufactured in his hometown of Akron, Ohio by a Firestone Tire and Rubber Company. So he looked at it and he was like, man, this is amazing from my hometown. And, and then he began to look at it again and he saw these numbers that were stamped on the belt. <clears throat> so he went home to Akron, Ohio, and he was so happy to see his mother and he saw his mother. They were just hugging each other, loving on one another. And um, when he finally met her and he told her what happened, he told his mother about how he had been thrown overboard, but this life belt had saved his life. And he said, you know, I found out that it was made in Akron, Ohio, right here in our city where we're from. And she said, well, son, while you were away, I decided to do what I can to help in this war. And I sh volunteered at the Firestone plant with these life belts. He stopped quickly, went to his duffel bag, got the life belt, and he put it on the table in front of his mother. And she looked at the life belt. And then she looked at those numbers that he didn't make, couldn't make sense of. She says, son, this is my inspection number. The one who created him would be the one who would save him. I want to let somebody out there know today. That we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because the one who saved us will be the one who saves us. The one who created us, nothing will separate us from his love. Staples was on the other side of the world, 8,000 miles away. But guess what? He did not outrun his mother's love. And it doesn't matter how far you try to run. If you have placed faith in Jesus, his love is so powerful that you cannot outrun his love. I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, I know, our Lord. I wonder if there's anyone in this room, you found yourself in a situation where you thought you were separated from God's love, but he used circumstances in life that have his fingerprints all over it because he wanted to bring you back to him. The trials, the tribulations, they were difficult. They were, but you made it through because his fingerprints was on it all along. His signature was on it all along. His inspection numbers was on the thing that saved you. See, Jesus on the cross would in a sense be separated from God. He would even say, Father, why have you forsaken me? He would be forsaken 
so that we never would be forsaken. And if you have tried Jesus, you know that he will never leave you nor forsake you. But there's one more thing that we need to know. Is that even though we turn the chapter and on day three, Jesus gets up out of the grave. Do you know that that's not the final chapter? Do you know that that's not the end of the story? We sang it earlier. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. But rising, he justified me. He freed me forever. Here it is. And one day, he's coming back. What a glorious day. The question is, are you coming with me? The question is, will you be one of the ones when Jesus comes back for that final chapter? Will you be one that he comes back to get? You may feel like you've outrun his love. But on today, he is reminding you that the one who saved you can save you even from as far as you've drawn from him. So I thank God for my mountains. And I thank him for the valleys. And I thank him for the storms he's brought me through. For if I never had a problem, I never know that God could solve it. I never know what faith in his word could do. That's the reason why today I say through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust his word. That's why for me, Jesus is the best thing has ever happened.